So hello, this is Jonathan Grauer. I'm editor-in-chief of North American Spine Journal and really pleased to be doing a podcast on one of our recent papers that was entitled Patterns of Concomitant Injury in Thoracic Spine Fracture. And here to talk about it with me today are two of the authors. If I can have you guys introduce yourselves. Sure. My name is uh, Mike Stoff. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon here at UMass and the uh, interim chair of orthopedics. I'm Ben Mitchell. I'm one of the chief residents at UMass, and I'm doing a spine fellowship next year in Miami. Great. Well, really, thank you for joining today, and thank you for this paper. Um, maybe just to kind of get us going, you can tell us a little bit kind of about the background and the paper that uh, uh, you published recently. Yeah, so, I, you know, I think a good area to start with this is kind of um, introducing, you know, our hospital a little bit and the, you know, surrounding population to put things into perspective. So, you know, the University of Massachusetts Hospital is in central Mass, we're in um, Worcester, Massachusetts. So we have, you know, some distance between the bigger cities and we have a large encatchment area in this, um, the middle of the state. And there's a lot of interstates that go by. We have, you know, an urban population nearby, but we also have, you know, rural areas that are, you know, fairly close as well. So we see, um, you know, quite a different mix of, of patients and a lot of different mechanisms of injury come through the hospital. Right. Um, you know, so, um, you know, when looking at this paper, you know, we, we wanted to really take a close look at thoracic fractures, you know, cervical fractures and lumbar fractures have been studied in much more detail, you know, especially with the associated injuries and, and mechanisms. Um, there's just not much data out there, you know, looking at these fractures and, you know, when do they occur, what types of, you know, mechanisms you know, are responsible for these things and, you know, what are the associated injuries and how common are, are those things? So that was one of the goals of the study. And, um, you know, we were able to do that with pretty good numbers. We, we took um, a five-year um, history of the patients that came through with thoracic fractures. Those were all um, pulled from a database, and we, we ended up with 683 patients with, you know, these injuries. And then from there, we kind of retrospectively and, and through the chart review collected data on the patients, including the demographics, um, you know, we looked into the level of injury, we classified the injury, and we looked at what other injuries they had in general. And um, we kind of divided those for our paper by, you know, body region. So we looked at head injury, we looked at chest injury, we looked at abdominal injury, and we looked at um, upper and lower extremity injury as well. Um, you know, so we were able to kind of get numbers on the associated incidents um, by body region, um, for different fracture types. Great. And when you say you kind of looked at it and culled it from your local database, is this a database that you guys collect specific to spine or orthopedics or trauma in general at your center? How do you do that? So for, for this database, we pull basically diagnostic codes for um, any thoracic fracture. We're able to, you know, hopefully thoroughly collect these patients and, uh, um, so we created our, our own database in that way. You know, most of these patients were trauma patients that came in, you know, at, at our institution, they're either flagged as a level one, two, or three. And so that would include the majority of the patients. And then, you know, for those patients that were seen in the emergency department with, you know, thoracic fracture and, and weren't a trauma activation, those would um, hopefully have been captured as well. Great. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about like the types of fractures you guys were seeing for thoracic injuries and then, you know, what, what the implications were for the associated fractures. Yeah. So, you know, um, we looked at several things and I'll go into the mechanisms first and I'll kind of touch on what you were talking about in the types. So, you know, when we looked at the, all the mechanisms for, for these fractures, we, you know, kind of broke them down by percentages and we mentioned these in the paper. And the, you know, the most common was from mechanical fall. Um, that was 38% of the fractures that, you know, kind of going down the line, fall from height, 25%, MVCs, 23%, and motorcycles, 5% here. So that, that accounts for more than 90% of the, you know, total fractures. We had some sporting related injuries that, that were kind of, uh, you know, moving up there too. Um, and uh, pedestrian struck 
was about the same at 3%. So, you know, with all those things combined, um, we were able to account for the majority of, um, of these things. Right. Perfect. I, I think that uh, just to give a little bit of additional um, background and in color to what really led us to, to asking these questions and, and looking at it a little bit more in detail is, is, is the fact that we do see a lot of trauma at our institution. Um, and what me and my other partners had noted was is a fairly significant pattern of concomitant injury in some of these patients. Um, and so we were, we worked hard to try to eliminate a lot of the, you know, osteoporotic compression fractures and, and things like that, that were relatively low energy. And even having removed many of those, we still had a fairly significant uh, uh, denominator in terms of the number of patients that we had. Um, but even people with treat, you know, fractures that were treated non-operatively, we noted um, in, in anecdotally, we note that, that people have rib fractures and, and thoracic injuries, sometimes that are sort of underappreciated um, by uh, non-spine providers. And, and we felt that it was important to highlight some of these concomitant injuries because it leads to fairly significant hospital stays. And sometimes it could lead to people being in the ICU for a while if they have other significant injuries. And, and, um, and so we wanted to sort of highlight these. I mean, I, and I think that patients that have thoracic fracture dislocations that are, you know, I think that the, those are relatively recognized in terms of uh, severity of injury and the energy that these, that these patients go through in terms of their trauma mechanisms. But even some of the more milder patients, uh, the milder spine injuries were, were noted to be associated with other injury patterns that, that led to fairly significant hospital stays and in, in care. Um, and so that was anecdotally what, what sort of led us to getting to the point where we wanted to look at this in detail because we felt that it, it really was not that well represented in the literature. Um, and when we started looking at some of the, some of the other so general surgery literature and the trauma surgery literature, and even the ATLS manual doesn't really have a whole lot about patients that have injuries like this. And so that's why we wanted to sort of look at it. Um, and so Ben here and is, is one of our chief residents going into spine and our, one of our other residents sort of spearheaded this project and really did a lot of hard work looking through a lot of charts. Um, you know, 680 plus patients is not an easy uh, amount of work to do. And sort of we, we, we got through all that. Um, and I think it does really highlight the fact that um, you know, these are fairly significant injuries in these patients. Maybe you can speak a little bit to kind of in terms of the findings, you know, in addition to numbers of injuries, like were there certain associations? In other words, when somebody sees the thoracic fractures and wants to think about what to take from the paper, are there kind of messages that you would send them with? Yeah, so, you know, I that was interesting because, you know, I thought we'd go in finding strong correlations, you know, between, you know, different mechanisms and, you know, you know, associated injury patterns, which is true in some sense, but there's definitely, you know, an overall trend of these associated injuries just being very high in general. And, you know, we, we look at mechanical falls as one of the subgroups um, of our patients and, you know, those overall are lower energy. And then in my head, I kind of group everything else, you know, the MVCs, motorcycles, um, pedestrian strike, those are all high energy, um, you know, fractures. So when you look at those compared to um, the mechanical, you know, ground level falls, the numbers are a lot higher in almost every category. And, you know, those, you know, chest, concomitant chest injury, um, abdominal injury, head injury, those are all very high, um, you know, head injury for these high energy mechanisms is over 50%. So, you know, these people are, are getting roughed up a little bit. And, you know, it's important to realize that not only um, during their care in the hospital, but I think, 
you know, when these patients are first coming in that, you know, all the providers, whether that be at the emergency department or, you know, the trauma surgeons, they need to kind of have high levels of suspicion um, to, you know, work these patients up for other injuries. And, you know, I think overall, you know, we have a fairly thorough and, you know, kind of um, process for, for working these trauma patients up. There's a standardized trauma protocol as there is at many hospitals and, you know, every patient is getting a seat, you know, an x-ray of their pelvis and chest. And then most patients are getting, you know, pan CT to cross their, you know, through their body, which includes their entire spine. So from our perspective, you know, the bases are covered, but, um, you know, a lot of these patients may have upper or lower extremity injuries. And we show that as well in the paper, those are fairly high in number, um, with these high energy mechanisms. So, um, you know, just having everyone on the same page in the hospital about these issues and, you know, the, the high rate of concomitant injuries, I think, important. Great. So it sounds like largely the review was confirmatory to your suspicion, kind of in a more numerical way. Were there things that surprised you? Anything that you found that you thought that wasn't what your kind of notion was going into this? Or was it mostly kind of supportive of this and really becomes a a point of able to be discussing it with the the teams involved? Yeah, no, I definitely think it's confirmatory. This is kind of, you know, what we thought, you know, how we thought this would pan out. Um, You know, that maybe the numbers are a little bit higher than I would have guessed, you know, you know, going in, but um, it's largely confirmatory. And I think that kind of turns the conversation towards, you know, how do we better um, first off diagnose these patients when they get into the hospital, but also, you know, how do we improve their hospital course and, you know, their recovery going forward. So, um, you know, we just collected a lot of data. We we collected data on their medical follow-up, their surgical follow-up, how long they're in the hospital, all their comorbidities. So we just have a lot of data here. And I think that there's a lot that can be done with this in the future. You know, we characterize the fracture types, but I think we can go back and look at those fractures again and, you know, kind of see how those patients were treated, whether that be bracing or whether that be surgery and, uh, you know, kind of get a better look at, you know, how decisions were made based on their their other injuries and kind of what what led them towards having the, you know, um, defined treatment that they had. Great. It sounds like a really powerful I would I would agree with that, I, and I think that just for me as a as a spine surgeon, I um, like I mentioned before, I think the severe injuries are are clearly going to have a lot of fairly significant kind of concomitant injury. But for me, even some of the more milder injuries that didn't require surgical treatment, those patients uh, had a lot of concomitant injury, um, and. Um, we felt like in some of those populations that um, things were potentially underrepresented in terms of people recognizing um, injury patterns and concomitant injury earlier. Um, and so that's, that was basically what um, was confirmed, but also sort of uh, surprising at how significant it really was when we looked at it. Wonderful. And to, to kind of add to that, you know, going back to your question, one of the things that maybe surprised me a little bit was, you know, I thought the surgical rate would be higher. You know, we, we just have, a, have our overall surgical rate and our surgical rate per, you know, different mechanisms. So, you know, the overall rate was, I believe, 10% and that ranged from five to 20 based on mechanism. So, you know, the overall sense that the ATLS guidelines and you know, the, the general surgery trauma teaching um, kind of hints at that number being higher um, in terms of, you know, these patients requiring surgery. So I think just kind of reframing um, everyone's mindset with this data and, you know, kind of seeing, you know, you know obviously the, the patient population and, you know, treatment decisions can be different institution to institution, but you know, looking at, looking at our numbers, we had an overall surgical rate of 10%. And, you know, the larger majority of the remainder of patients were braced. And, uh, you know, I think that is a finding that, you know, um, is important to, to kind of put some weight on as well. Right. 
anything else you want to share from the, the study or your experience in doing that? I don't think so. I, I think that, uh, you know, this is a, a large uh, retrospective data dredge, essentially, and it has a lot of, there's a lot of data here. Um, I think it definitely confirms some of the things that uh, we uh, were seeing um, just anecdotally. Um, and so moving forward, I, I think that some of these things certainly could be analyzed in, in, in larger national databases. And I know that you certainly have done some work with that, John. Um, and that this study potentially could lead, could lead us to um, doing more work with a larger database and or collecting data prospectively, following patients out and collecting outcomes. Um, challenging in a trauma population, but certainly would be useful. I'll say, you know, having worked a lot with large databases, one of the things that you all have the power and ability to answer more than the databases is having the more granular information about fractures, patients, the actual course. And, and I do hope and look forward to, to seeing a lot more as you kind of delve into that, because I think that that's really going to be a, a, a powerful way to look at that. Great. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for joining today to talk about the study. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. That was great.